Hi, everybody. Will here with this week's interview chair. This week, sitting in the chair, we have Janice Hayes. Hope you enjoy it. Hi, everybody. Today's interview chair is Janice Hayes. How are you, Janice? I'm good. How are you? Good. It's good to see you. You and Eric just got back from vacation. Yes, was in the Bahamas on a work trip, so not too shabby. <laughs> Very good. Things going great otherwise? Yeah, I'm loving it. So, same old. <laughs> well, we're going to get into what you're doing. As last okay. Time. But, for, but I'm going to start the way I always start. Can you tell me how you got involved in the sport of dogs? Start off with how old you were when you got involved, please. Okay. Well, I was eight, going on nine, and we had la lost our old short hair. Um, my dad used to do field and obedience. So when he went to get a Vishla, um, it had to be shown the one that he wanted to take into the field. So she had great instinct. My dad wanted her for field. And so the breeder was like, well, that's great and all, but she's kind of the pick of the litter. Do you mind having her show? And he's like, well, if my kids can show her, we'll show her. <laughs> and so we got hooked. Well, I should say I got hooked. My sister tried it, but she was not as enthusiastic as I was about it. Probably because little sister beating big sister is not fun. So I jumped in. I was all in for it. I loved every minute of it. We ended up actually showing um, a couple of Vishla brothers who, when we were nine, because then you could show in juniors when you were nine, I believe, maybe it was 10, maybe we started in matches and then went into um, regular shows. But we were 10 or I was 10. The boys were 11. So our Vishlas were full on white faces, white legs. Oh, geez. There's a little kid. So I'm sure I can dig up a photo somewhere for you for that one. But it was, <laughs> it was. I'd like to see that one. Now. Oh. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of where I got started. I, I fell in love with it from the time I stepped into our first match. We used to have matches and matches is where, before I ever went into a dog show, I probably did 15 matches before we ever went to an actual dog show. So we had practiced a lot and my poor dogs got worked and worked and worked. <laughs> so by the time they were showing, they were sick of it, but I just was hooked. And I, ever since then, I told my dad I was gonna be showing dogs. My mom was like, fine, I'll cart you around. And I just, went off from there but yeah and where, where were you where did you live at that time virginia okay from virginia yeah so we were out in gloucester county and there were lots of shows um uh, my parents did not show dogs so i really had to have a lot of mentors kind of all over the place um the first handler i ever really worked for um like actually going and working was andrew doyle so he <laughs> yeah, he, he definitely taught me all about trimming um, and he made sure I did it really well. So he didn't have to do it as much once we <laughs> got good at it and uh, he would just make me rough everyone out. And then the fine tuning is what he would just really come out and just, you know, uh, George Alston would come by the kennel and just kind of look through some English cockers and Irish and just kind of really go through them yeah, and then, like, that's too much pressure right and we put him on the table and he would george would be like you trimming this kid and i'm like and he'd be like okay fix this fix this fix this but the rest looks good and it was amazing learning uh, just amazing to learn that way so i got really lucky in how that all fell in that was probably when i was like 14 i started maybe 13 started working for andrew then but I, I got so much knowledge from his trimming. He was just 
he had an amazing gift when he really just taught you that not every dog is the same. And I think that was such a big deal is really finding the faults, finding the good things and making sure they spoke to each other. So when you trim, you're trimming with a purpose for that dog and not just you do all feet this way, you do all clipper work this way. He was just very into the fact that you have to match the clipper work to the dog's head. You have to match the lines to the individual animal. And that to me is something I think a lot of people kind of get lost on a little bit these days oh, yeah. when they're everything. It's all. <laughs> yeah. I, an Irish setter, an English setter and a Gordon setter should never have the same trim. And, and that was such a big deal. Like it, it was just, they're different breeds and they should be trimmed accordingly kind of thing. So that was really in, instilled in my head. So Springers and English Cockers, none of them are the same. So I think, and then every dog within is different. So that definitely helped. I was very quiet back then and I, I never left the setup. So I just listened all the time and just watched everybody in the setups around me trimming dogs. So I, I really had a passion for trimming back then because I had short hairs and bichelas and <laughs> I them as much. So when Aaron Kerfoot gave me my first Springer for juniors, I was all about the trimming. So yeah, that's kind of where that started. How old were you then when you got the Springer? Um, well, my poor short hair, he ended up being epileptic and he bloated as he got older and he got really tired of dog shows so at that point our family did not breed dogs we did not we were like two dog household so my short hair was my exciting dog just for me and then he got so tired of it so I think when I was I think I had to be I'd be 14 ish. So maybe open junior going into open senior. And we had gone on a trip to, I think it was San Antonio when they had the qualifiers for juniors. Um, we drove to San Antonio and on the way back, Aaron and her dad were like, I think it's time you get a new juniors dog. Cause he was just over it. I mean, bless him. He didn't have a front to save his life. So I would, you know, have to do all the timing just to get him to stand up over his front. And by the end, he was like, he had about two seconds to see him well stacked. And then that was over. I mean, he was tired of it. So they gave me one of their um, dogs that they had finished and were going to place. And my mom ended up taking him so I could go to her house and trim him and show him on the weekends and do all that kind of stuff. So it definitely upped my game a little bit when I had a Springer to actually show in juniors. I never was a big winner in juniors. I qualified for the garden. I never made it to the finals. Um, I never was ranked. <laughs> there was none of that stuff. Cause you know, if I got anything below a B, I couldn't go to dog shows. So I had to, um, I had to test it. So one time, I think it was Westchester weekend. I got a C and Andrew was really mad at me. And I thought he was going to talk my dad into letting me go still. And he was like, nope, we had an agreement. He's like, but I really needed help this weekend. So you kind of screwed me on this one. I was like, oh my. I, I felt so bad. So needless to say, I never got below a B after that, just so I could go to shows. Um, but you always have to test it when you're a kid. <laughs> that's great that he that he still he, he still didn't let you go that's good, yeah. good both, both were like that was the deal you blew it and i was like oh okay so I, I, got my I really need help i don't know yeah. Yeah. So, I was like me now i'd be like okay we're gonna work on this we're gonna do homework over yeah. the weekend Try but, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i know but i had to test it it's fine <laughs> <laughs> How long did you work for Andrew? Um, probably from when I was 14 till I was about 19. So six years, six good years. Yeah. So when I left there, I went to work for Clint and I worked for Livingston. Yeah. I worked for him for six years. So I, how was I, that change? It was a big change because yeah. with we had a very limited whatever fit in the van. And we didn't make them fit. It was a set amount. So about 10 to 12 dogs. Um, so it was very specific. 
like this is the amount of dogs we take we don't take too many more just because everything was coated you know everything had trimming so it took longer and he was just a very perfectionist when it came to grooming. so we kept very limited so when I went to Clint's it was a whole new world because it was you know everybody shows like everyone it was I was used to not going into the ring as much and I remember that first weekend with Clint I was in the ring more than I have ever been in the ring <laughs> which means I never shown and so it was totally different but a great experience because I got my hands on every breed there was I mean they're just we had dogs you know constantly in that area it's just you just show a lot of dogs I mean it's yeah. just a lot so it was totally different because the I didn't learn as much on grooming obviously because I was doing more of the grooming but a different way of doing it, but I think working for different people is great just to find out what works for you. So, you know, I learned to drive like no other when I worked for Clint. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, East Coast, where you can go three different directions and still be home on a Sunday night by like 10, or going to Texas, where if you get home Sunday night before midnight, that is something because it's just such a big state. So for me, that was like, that was hard. That was I eye -opening. Do it. I, I look at all my Western friends. I don't know how they do it. You know? So much. And California is kind of the happy medium. Yeah. So Kent, you don't have as many options for sure. So you have to go to Northern or Southern, but there's usually something pretty much close where, I mean, it's still a lot of driving, but nothing. I can still get home Sunday nights and <laughs> be home because- I, I am a big stickler about getting home and letting the dogs be dogs and get out and run after a weekend in crates. They're ready to go. They're ready to do their routine. So I, I'm a big stickler. As you get older, it does get harder to drive. Everyone tells me that, you know, when you're younger and you hear it over and over again, hey, okay, you're not going to be able to drive like that. And I'm like, well, I'm not there yet. So it gets a little tougher but I have a great assistant that I actually is the only person I've ever trusted to drive my dogs. If I get too tired and we want to get through, she, she, <laughs> so in the young days, you didn't even need an alarm to wake up. You just woke up. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Yeah. It's not as easy anymore, but it definitely was a different experience, but I learned what breeds I wanted to do more. I love the setters, but the setters aren't what they used to be. <laughs> so I don't enjoy them like I used to. I used to really love showing setters. And now it's just, if I show one every now and then I get, I'm like, oh, I can still do this. I still got these skills, but I'm okay. Like <laughs> I, I, could, I got my springers down. I'm pretty good with that. So I, I think you find what, when you're working for a handler that shows a lot of different dogs, you find what you get comfortable in and where you want to build your business. So I think that, and, and when I worked for Clint, that's when I fell in love with PBGDs. So that to me was the biggest gift ever because that I will never not have an entire potato chip bag of them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> one is not enough. You need a handful and they're amazing. So for me, that was I, I absolutely love that experience because I got to have amazing PBGV after amazing PBGV and learn the breed and fall in love with them. And I just got really lucky there. Yeah, so. I think it's important too to get your hands on a lot of different breeds. Yeah. Even if you're not going to like specialize in them. I think it's important to know about them. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It just helps you, you find your niche somewhere because right. and worked for Bill and Taffy through a summer um, cause I wanted to learn more scissoring. Uh, like I, not that I wanted to do poodles. I just wanted to learn how to hold the scissors correctly because I was kind of self came to, oh, I lost uh, you. I know. Hang on. Uh,
I knew that would happen. I knew somebody was going to call me in the middle of it. Yeah, and now I know what happened. Oh, <laughs> are you on your phone? Yeah. This is pretty good for a phone. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It, but on well, my computer, it makes every sound and I can never get the sounds off. So, but with what I was saying was like, I went to Bill and Taffy's to work on trimming with holding scissors correctly and learning because being self-taught before I went to Andrews, I never really learned to hold like scissors correctly in the right fingers. So Andrew would be like, what are you doing? But he wasn't, he just didn't have the skill of, well, like, hold it like this, where Taffy just has that knack of hold it like this while we're driving down the road and keep doing this, just doing your thumb. Like, and she's like, doing that will make it register in your brain. You'll put it in without having to do it on the dog and then it'll become comfortable and then you can do it. And at the time she had her old standard poodle dog. And I mean, he would take, I would do him on my days off. He would take like five hours to dry and then another, you know, I mean, he on just your day off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I want, that's like, I wanted to do it. And so it was like, his coat was just amazing so it was a great way to like learn to trim and it's like not that I'm a poodle person or that I ever want to do them that is an art that is not for me but knowing that I I can right. have the skills and just good to have. everything else so and learning terriers bill was amazing teaching flat work and you know you they're just to me, they're, they're still my favorite mentors, and I go to them with any dog I have, any problems I can't figure out on, um, just because their the knowledge and their pinky is more than most people can ever have in this business. So I just really value that and just being able to know that I can do flat work. I can put a terrier together if I need to, you know, those kind of things. It's not my passion. I learned it's not my passion. I don't like cleaning up dirty crates. So I know one terrier, you don't have dirty crates. A whole kennel full, you're going to have dirty crates. So those are the things you learn when you're working for other people. So I have a kennel full of PBGVs and Goldens and Springers, and I don't have dirty crates. <laughs> but Cavaliers, they're not dirty for the most part. So I try, I'm like, I like breeds that don't really want to want to be in that too much so those are the kind of things you learn working for other people I think just picking up what breeds work with you and which ones you want to you know spend yeah. more time yeah so we, we jumped ahead a bit we, we were working for yeah. Clint. how long were you with Clint six years oh you did tell me that I'm sorry yeah, yeah. they're six years too and so then that, you were how old then is um so I think I went on my own when I was, oh my God, math is hard. I think 25, 26. I think that's about when I went on my own. So you and went on your own right after Clint? Yes. Yes. So then I was in Texas for, I ended up being in Texas for 12 years. So I think I was on my own for six years after I left Clint. Apparently a six year thing is my... <laughs> I'm not seven. I'm too impatient for that seven year itch. Apparently it's a six year itch. So then I was in Texas for about six more years because I was there for 12 years. Um, and I built a kennel there, just had great clients there, but I hated the dog shows there, the dirt barns, which half of them I was allergic to, um, and just small rings when you were inside. So that's kind of where I I kind of got my business going. I had an amazing PBGB client there that let me kind of take over the breeding program. And we just got lucky and had some beautiful dogs. And I kind of got to put my name on that breed and um, still get to. So I've, I've had the best relationships in that breed that have really helped me go off, go a long way in the breed. So I got to kind of nurture it there in Texas. Cause I actually had some quite a few nice dogs there that did well. So then that's when, after those six years, I was like, all right, I want to go where I can go to outside shows again. Cause the East coast used to have a lot of outside shows, but it just, none in Texas really is there. Yeah. In Texas, you just can't, I mean, the summers are just brutal, but 
I, when I worked for Bill and Taffy, I loved all the outside shows. So you, I was like, you went out on your own in Texas, but you went to California, you worked for Bill and Taffy. No, I went, I worked for Bill and Taffy between like in a couple summers between with Clint. Oh, okay. So yeah. So when I moved, I knew I wanted to go out by them because I loved it so much. Like the part of me still regrets not just staying there because I loved it so much then, but I had told Gavin and Sarah I would come back to Clint's and finish up Woody's career. So I was like, all right, I'll go finish Woody's career up. So um, I went back to Clint's and then kind of got stuck in Texas for longer than I had planned. But then I just, I finally was like, all right, I'm, I got to do this. So I finally got up and went to California and I have been here longer than six years. <laughs> so, so there's that. That's good. So yeah. Yeah. I've been out. You went to California then. Yeah. I've been out here, I think nine years now. So I love it. Yeah. Cause Eric and I've been here together eight years. So it's nine years now oh. that I've been out. Here. Yeah. So that seems crazy. Doesn't seem that long, but I love it. I love the outside shows, big rings. I get to show dogs that move and I can keep up with them still. So I think that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, I love it. I, I just, it's a different you atmosphere. You can tell you love it. So. I do. I love it. It's, it fits me. <laughs> <laughs> so you've yeah. had, you've had some dogs over the years. Um, just touch on a few, I don't want to, I don't want to say favorites, but some that are right. come to your memory right away. Yeah. Um, so John Wayne was a uh, orange and white PBGB that I showed when I first went on my own and the dog was ahead of his time. Like I, I look back at photos now and I'm just like, if I had that dog now, yeah, now. <laughs> top hound and I'd be running around this country showing them off to everyone. But because of that dog, you know, when you're first on your own, it's tough for people to take you seriously. And then I was going up against Clint head to head all the time. So we went back and forth a lot, but I got to win the national under Dorothy McDonald with them and things like just some really big wins with that dog. Not, not necessarily number one all the time or anything like that, but just some wins that meant a lot to me. And then what he produced has been, you know, multiple national winners, you know, just group winners, best in show winners, the temperaments I wanted. We sent him to England with Gavin and Sarah and he finished in England and, so he was a game changer for me for, for people to take me seriously in the breed, just starting out. So I think that one was huge. And, and his daughter was that, um, Texas and I won two nationals with her. And then she got a group two at the garden and just, she was a dog like that one just let everyone know that she was mine and she made it to 14 and died from eating a rock because <laughs> why not when you're 14? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she made it through some little generic surgeries that they're like, this could be it. And then, you know, seeing a rock in her stomach, I'm like, that's going to be what gets her. And it finally, she just didn't make it, but it was, she was one of those that just kind of changed the whole game for me where I could like show my own dog and have so much fun showing your own sometimes. And Donna and Donnie helped with her. And she was just, I, I knew that's where my heart was. Once I got that one, I was like, this is where my passion is. I never thought I wanted to breed dogs. I was all about the showing the conditioning, all of that. But with that one, I was like, I want to breed this breed because people need to know this breed exists. This breed needs to stay on the map. Um, I think it's the best kept secret in dogs. I think that if you know one, it's to love them, all their naughty antics and living with them. They're just, I mean, you know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> they're amazing. They're just a cool breed and they can frustrate you like no other, but they'll make you laugh the next minute. So I just, she was a game changer for me. She just, that was, that was where I was like, okay, this is where I belong. I, this is the road I want to take, you know, that passion was there for her. And then, um, obviously Liz, the Springer, I mean, talk about a whirlwind with that one. Um, she came two weeks, basically two weeks to the day I lost my 14 year old dog. 
uh, Springer dog that had gone through hell and back with me. So her timing was beyond special. So the fact that Aaron bred her and, you know, we, you know, we used to joke in juniors, Aaron's like, well, I'm going to go get my PhD and you can show all the dogs. And when we were kids and then 20 years (laughs) for that to actually be like, what happened was just so weird. It was just like one of those, like, is this really happening? And so we won the national that year um, under Steve. And that was just huge ordeal. Like, cause I, as I'm walking into, you know, the building the first time, every black and white veteran dog that could walk through the building <laughs> walked in front of me. And so I literally went to the bathroom three times to cry it out, you know, cause it had been only Aww. like... <laughs> So I like every time I walk out, there's another black and white dog, you know, veteran walking in front of me. And I'm like, Ooh, someone ripped my heart out. I should have be here. And then I had to work my butt off for that. I mean, he ran us so many times and that bitch just never quit. And so that national was a huge, I never imagined winning the Springer national, not even in my wildest dreams. And then fast forward to the garden that year, like four months later, I, to this day, look at every photo from that garden and tell everyone, why didn't you tell me to put the scissors down? Because I just (laughs) kept trimming her. And I'm just like, I mean, she didn't have as much hair yet anyways, but I'm like, I just, I was so nervous. Mark Threffrol did the breed. I mean, for me, working for Andrew and, you know, I had watched him growing up you know, he just, Mark and Bonnie both were just like up here in that breed. And I'm just like, oh my God, I just have to not mess up so we can get opposite. Like that was my, I was like, if we could go opposite, this would be a huge way to kick her off this year. Cause it's Springers. It's, you know, it's the most, it, that breed is just so much talent and one breed competing every weekend, all the time. And it was just so intimidating to come in with a special because I hadn't special to Springer ever. Like, so it was like just crazy. And so I walk in there and everybody's there and he just sorted through those so fast. I was like, God, this is going to be so fast. Well, then he got down to the cuts and he made us work and work and work and a couple of my friends, like Laura and Robin, both were like, yeah, he makes you go around to do a free bait and you don't just do one. You do one, she nails it. You spin her around, she does another one and you nail it. And I was, (laughs) it was just one of those, I mean, it was seven people deep. Everybody was watching because it was him. It was the last breed of the day kind of thing. And it was just, you know, it came down to Robin and I, and she has been such a huge mentor for me over the years, regardless. And, you know, helped me with her trimming and helped, you know, get us there and to come down between her and I, it was very emotional. It was very like overwhelming. And I like, to this day, I still think I blacked out those last, (laughs) like, I don't know what actually happened, but there's photos. So I know it happened. (laughs) So It was one of those. And she was the first person to hug me when, when, you know, I won and that kind of stuff, but to win under Mark huge. It was just, that is a memory that will, I, he has no idea, you know, how important it was to me, but it was just such a big deal to me. And the worst part was Aaron was not there that year. <laughs> so she did not come up, um, cause of school and all kinds of stuff. So she wasn't there. So she got to watch it, but then she kind of was like, she didn't tell me I had Like, we didn't talk about the judges. I was just like, well, Mark's going to do what he wants to do. If we get it out of there, great. Well, Aaron wasn't really upfront about the fact that Ken Murray happened to fall in love with her at a show when she had her as a young dog. And so I had people saying, oh, you could do something in the group tonight. And I was like, uh, Aaron, why is everyone saying this? She's like, well, he kind of sort of like her. So don't up. And I was like, no, great. 
there's that pressure because <laughs> the breed wasn't enough. Now we have to go show it again. Two so, spring icons. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was intimidating. So needless to say, that group we're in was, I still, it, like that whole thing plays in your mind. I refuse to watch it still because I'm like, I know how it goes. <laughs> I don't want to watch it and be disappointed at something that I did. So I don't watch it. Like everyone's like, have you watched it? I'm like, no, I don't think I'll ever watch that one. Cause in my head it was so, you know, I, I was lucky enough to show bunny and best in show, you know, when, when I worked Flint. So I had watched it afterwards and I just ripped everything I did apart. Like I was going too slow in one part and then I went too fast in the other part. And then that was the year heckling started and it was when Mick was in there. So everybody was screaming out names and poor bunny. You could just see the IV. Then you could just see her ears flicking the whole time. And so I knew from the, after doing that, I won't go back and watch anymore. <laughs> in my head, it was great. And then I watched it. I was like, Oh my God, I messed up there. I messed up there. And so I didn't do that with Liz. <laughs> I was like, I did not look. <laughs> so yeah. Being, being in that best in show uh, with Liz was pretty special. I think you kind of enjoyed it too. <laughs> it was a fun group in that best in show. We all just yeah. had a good time out there. I've never watched, I, I, I watched it once. You have it, yeah. Once. Yeah, because you have it here. Uh, and it, it was so right? fun. Like, I just remember how much fun we had in best in show that year. Like, I just, everybody was just having... Like your, our dogs all showed good. Nobody really knew what was going to happen. It was just one of those. We'll just see how this plays out. And we just all, you know, had a really good time in there. So I'm like, it's fine. I don't need to watch it. It's up here. <laughs> <laughs> it came on, came on TSN up here, which is our ESPN. Yeah. So I watched it once and actually Harvey sent me a copy of it. I've never, I've never. No. Yeah. And how, how did you feel about that when you watched it? I, I got yelled at by George and Janie anyway, so it didn't matter. I knew I screwed up. <laughs> yep, yep, they were right. Darn it. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. We do that to ourselves. It's bad. That's perfect. It's fine. <laughs> I know. That was a, that was an exciting year, obviously. Yeah. And she went on to do some other great things after that. She's yeah. Still- yeah, she did great after that. And people still think she was number one Springer there, that year. She wasn't. <laughs> we just it's had amazing some- <laughs> how perception is, you know, because yeah. that's a dog they <laughs> think and see all the time. I think we were actually the number four Springer that year. But I'm like, those are the things that I always tell clients. I was like, people don't necessarily remember rankings. I know I don't. They're I don't remember dogs. It's it's the wins, the the ones that you feel are special, those are the ones that always stick out. Because Liz was never number one Springer. It was, but people remember her. Like it's her performances. It was her attitude. It was that kind of stuff. So that's that's I I do a lot of that when I'm because I I struggle with how many shows there are now, and I know I personally can't keep up with that many shows. So I'm like, if you want someone to run for number one, find another handler. <laughs> as bad as it is, I just know that my mentality can't keep up with the amount now that you have to do. Right. I couldn't imagine. So. I mean, no one is Laura King quite like Laura King running around with that Sammy and making sure she got to that last weekend of no one could touch her. And that, I'm like, that's how you have to do it these days. You've got to blow it out of the water and let people know you're going for number one or it's a race until that last dog show. And it is intense. And I'm just, <laughs> I don't know if I did it in enough years with Clint that I'm like, I'm good. I got the t-shirt. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> it's like, cause we, when I worked for him, we had, I think we had two years of number one hounds. And then before that was the Brittany, he was number one sporting. And then we had Woody, who was like number two hound. So we were, we were, always specialing something. I think that was the top non-sporting dog. So it was just always somebody running. And I'm just like, like with the Grand last year, I was just like, we're not running for number one hound. 
She's like, yeah, I'm good with that. I was like, but we're going to go for that record. <laughs> She's like, okay, I'm good with that. So we had our own goals and it's fun when they happen to work out. Unfortunately, the Springer dog McConaughey I had was probably the only dog I've ever shown that I didn't get to have that big. I like to end them on top. So that dog was heartbreaking because I never got the, he never got the show career he should have had where we had shows out here outside where that dog could move all day long and show off, you know, what he could do at our normal shows. So we had to go show to people that, you know, we wouldn't normally show to and had to go head to head with everybody every weekend because of the, of the pandemic. So he only had those, you know, I think we started back up in June. So we had a June to December and it was disappointing because then I kept him for the garden and (laughs) the last two weeks or three weeks is when we had the judge change and that was rough is, is to keep them in shape and be ready to have your last hurrah with them. And then, you know, the judge and I just agreed to disagree on <laughs> the dog and we knew, and it's, yep. I have a judge that, you know, you have no chance other than, you know, thinking you might have a chance and never had a chance. So it was just, that was probably the one career that was, I, I have just been really lucky in finishing them out with a bang and just, he never got that. And I just, that you feel so guilty on those. I don't know why it wasn't my fault. No, it's all good timing. Yeah. We knew we'd have a pandemic and that kind of stuff. So, you know, but that, that one was rough. That was rough to chew back because he was a good dog and I just not enough judges got to put their hands on him the way I wanted them to. So that one was, that one was kind of hard to chew back, but for the most part, I've had really some awesome dogs that got to have their moments to shine and, like the grand, I was, we had, we kind of struggled because we were going to show him through the garden. I obviously it was supposed to be in January, but then it got moved to June. And I'm like, I've had your dog for three years. It's time, you know, it's time. And he, you know, winning that group in Florida, I, what more could he do? He broke the record. He won that group there. And I was like, let's just end it on the high and just oh, sure. let way so instead of keeping them for another six months for one dog show so you know it, it, those decisions are tough the yeah. one you have to like decide which one to do so but it's he ended up off sometimes it really is you know yeah yeah you have to you have to know when so. yes yes and i always want to try to be that person not like oh god they're still showing that <laughs> i don't want to <laughs> it's yeah. hard but well that what about we've we've talked about a few of your mentors we've talked about andrew we've talked about bill and taffy and even clint do you have other ones that you have relied on over the years well for breeding wise um gavin and sarah robertson and wendy doherty like their knowledge that they have shared with me has been amazing every time i've gone to gavin's in england i go through his whole kennel and he has the patience to go through the whole kennel and we put every dog on the table and uh, they have, you know, 30 PBGBs. We put every dog on the table. We go over every single one and we start, he just starts telling his plan of where they're going and why, you know, this shorter back to this longer one and just the proportion wise and how he sorts them out. And it's so simple to him. And it's so, it's so valuable to have someone that is that knowledgeable, just willing to share it so easily. So I have been so lucky besides the fantastic dogs I've shown of theirs. Um, they have just been so supportive. And, you know, when I start breeding our own, they're still obviously their breeding program. I just am lucky enough to tap into it and have had some of their fantastic dogs in my lines, but even now, you know, they're, you know, two generations away from their dogs and they still help me. Like I'll send them puppy pictures and I'm like, I like this one for this. And I like this one for this. And he's like, well, the next generation, what do you need? And let's, let's take the one that's going to help with that generation. And it's just to be able to break them down and just know you have backup when you like are stuck picking between two puppies And just knowing you have that other opinion that, you know, I would let him buy me a dog of any breed. Do not tell him this. If he's watching, he's good. 
business. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> Gavin, headphones, put them. I don't want any of Probably this. I just made Sarah's life miserable for that. Uh, Sarah is, <laughs> I mean, she's the same. But Gavin, put your headphones in. This is not about you. It's about a different Gavin. But <laughs> he, he has been huge on helping me and just, you know, when my grooming, he feels my frustration with the grooming, with the breed. And he's like, you stick to your guns and you know how they're coached. And he's like texture above all else. And, you know, he's just really been supportive through my years on my own, my chaos years. And now they're just, they're family at this point. So yeah, they're they're awesome. And Wendy has always been amazing. So (laughs) she's, She's my little light. I'm trying to get her to come to the national because the boy <laughs> now she bred and cones him too. So okay. I'm like, I wanted to get her to the national. I'm gonna get her to- a few weeks. I know. I love her. So she's the best. So, but no, I they have been a huge and to me to have a mentor in your breed that you respect so much is just is so huge. And it's so hard to find, I think to really have someone you have such a great working relationship with. So, you know, I've gotten really lucky there because he's as passionate about the breed as anyone. So it's like, yeah. and he can, he makes it so easy to listen to him talk about the breed. Like that's where I'm like, it's so easy for me to grasp the concept, but I can't get it across to the judges, you know, in the field, if they were field dogs, their coat would be pulled out. I'm like, if you just let their hair grow and did nothing to it, they would look like a Tibetan terrier with <laughs> heart. Like it's it's one of those. I'm like, it is a dog show, and you know, we just have to like remind people back to that. It's like if they were in the field romping through the field, the rough brush and that terrain would pull their hair out. So right. it would be shorter anyway. So you know, it's that those things. But he's just always been like well you gotta word it like this and word it like that and it's helped a lot because he's got a very duh way of saying it (laughs) he's like duh that's how you say it (laughs) yeah yeah there's but the passion there is is really impressive for someone that's been the breed as long as he has so yeah but And yeah, any others, obviously. Well, Erin, but with Springers, yeah. but I mean, she's she w- has always been ahead of her time and not a big breeder. She doesn't, you know, have litters as much as she probably would like to because of life, but every litter has a purpose. And, you know, I don't pl- I do not claim to be a Springer breeder. I get people come to me a lot. Oh, you breed Springers. No, I bred one litter because it was Liz's daughter and I know Aaron would kill me if I sent her back to her to be bred because she's a nut. She's just like my complete house pet. So <laughs> she's actually locked in the room right now with her daughter, <laughs> all crap, everything around us. So I was like, I bred one litter. So I have two bred by champions now working on the third, but I'm like, I am not a Springer breeder. If you want to talk Springer breeding, go to Aaron. It, she just, has studied the breed since we were in juniors. I mean, she's yeah. had them her whole life. Um, so, you know, there, she's just, she's awesome. She can talk about them, you know, all day long and her, her breeding. It's just impressive to me with every breeding she does, she gets what she wanted out of them. So it's impressive to like be able to still do that with such limited breeding, which is how right. I so limited because trying to be a breeder when you show dogs is difficult. And thank God Eric has a passion for the breed too now because he didn't get much choice because they (laughs) they forced him to love them. So, you know, he's great with litters, you know, when they get older. Luckily, I still have yet to make him well a litter by himself. My bitches somehow have always waited for me to get home or before I left. I mean, one time Calamity had a 12-hour window to have her puppies and I did her toenails to see if I could hurry it up. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I had to hurry up, do their toenails. And so she literally had her, I think she had six 
And then I got on a plane about four hours later. And (laughs) so he's yet to have to welt them by himself, but he loves them. He is game for all of it. Luckily he works from home so he can, you know, stay with them and, and not have to leave them. But it's hard when you show dogs to try to breed litters, you have to time it so well. And, you know, it's, it's tough, but I still, it's one of my favorite things is breeding, (laughs) which I did not, I would. You weren't, you weren't expecting that, were you? (laughs) What about advice for, uh, Young, young people that want to be handlers. Oh, I struggle there because it's not like it used to be. I feel like um, there's a lot of one dog owners these days, which makes it kind of difficult. Um, not that one dog owners are bad, but it's just hard to work, get a working relationship with someone that just has one dog and know when that dog is done, chances are it's going to be until they get another dog down the road to actually be shown to actually get that working relationship with. So for me, you want to find breeders that you want to work with because that's where you're going to find your knowledge and find, find just a rapport with someone on a regular basis. And I think breeders now appreciate handlers more than I, I thought they did in the beginning. So I think finding like with Donna and I, when we started working together with the PVs, you know, we just had a great relationship on how to, you know, where we were going next, what dog we wanted to special next and just always having something ready. If something wasn't there ready, we'd go to Gavin and Sarah and be like, okay, we're in between. We need a year in between. And you know, that's when we got like Annie Mac. Yeah. Like we didn't have anything ready yet. I knew the dog I wanted to show after her, but I didn't have anything there. And when they offered her, I about died. And then of course we get to later and that's the dog I'm showing now is, you know, you had this outstanding male out of her, but we had years of visions of what to do next. And you don't get that with the one dog owner. Right. Kind of. So I think, you have to have a happy medium of finding breeders to work with. Like I have some great golden breeders that I work with now, you know, the one dog owners are their breeding. So they'll recommend that, but the breeders are where you need to build relationships and you need to become knowledgeable in that breed. And yes, everybody, anybody can be a handler these days. It's, but to me, the, the importance of that they are animals and they depend on you for everything. I don't think it's stressed enough. The amount of pressure and the amount of responsibility on your shoulders. And I think people take it too lightly. Um, For me, it's just, I feel like I haven't slept since I was nine years old. (laughs) When you start thinking of the responsibility of someone else's dog, like I had to whelp Annie because obviously we bred her and got puppies here before she went back to England. Breeding and whelping my own dogs is stressful. When it's someone else's dogs that you're whelping, like I'm texting Sarah and Gavin and, you know, every puppy with her, they were ginormous and she was petite and every puppy took almost eight hours. There was only three boys and it was eight hours each puppy. And I'm like, do I take her for a C-section? Do I not? We're working it through the bitch ate between each puppy. So it was like, she's obviously, (laughs) she's okay. But it was just like that responsibility is on your shoulders. And I don't think people take that as seriously as they should. That's That's where much as they used to anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And my assistant, I love her for this. And and it's like, I, I, I'm trying to push her to go on her own because she has been in dogs her whole life and she understands her response, but she's scared. And I'm like, you should be scared. It is scary. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a lot. And she's 23. So she's worked for people her whole life and, but it should be scary to take on someone else's animal, their house pet. I know how awful I am when I send my dog with somebody. I'm like, so you have to have a little grace on when they're checking up on them. You know, obviously don't check up with a handler on Monday morning. You're not going to get a happy person. (laughs) Give us a little time to breathe. 
but it's as much as about the dogs, it's about, about the people too, and choosing people that you want to work with and that you can learn from them as much as you're going to help them that they're helping you too. So I think that's very important. And I don't think people take that as serious as they should, especially younger people. Now, I just, I, I just think it's a little too easy and owners are a little too easy to just hire whoever's around. And then there, you have the problem like we have in Southern California, there's a lot of handlers, but it's not necessarily people I would recommend for their dog. But I, I have a limit. I don't want too many dogs at my house. I, you know, I have my own dogs and I want enough time to work with them. So I keep a very limited number of client dogs. And so when they're not wanting to be as patient or I don't have room for them, it's like, who do you recommend them to? That's a challenge. It's a real So I get why people take so many dogs, but you have to know your limit. You've got to know what works for you. You know, my clients know we're taking a weekend off a month, like with five day shows and four day shows. Conditioning is huge and mentally conditioning them is huge. And for a dog to be home for two days out of a week, if you're lucky, that's hard. That it's it's hard on them. It's hard on us. You know, when you just get home, I used to tear my van apart every week and clean it. You can't do that when you're two days home anymore. Like it's just, it's either I bathe and trim all the dogs, clean everything properly, or, you know, something gets where I'm going to bathe the dogs at the dog show instead of cleaning and clean the van out. So you have to like, nowadays you have to make those choices or I have to hire someone to come do that. And I like doing everything myself, so that's a problem. But we tired just talking about it. <laughs> I know, I know, but that's one of those like control freak things where okay, so once a month we'll pull things out of the van and give it an overhaul. But when you have two days at home, you can't no. do all the things like we used to do. We used to have, you know, two day weekends, specialties on Friday. Or, you know, Tar Heel Circuit would be the freak circuit, like where it's like, or Warrington and, you know, Virginia, where you'd have like eight shows and one show site they were or something. Fun. They were fun shows. They were fun because they, <laughs> they were Right, that exactly, exactly. Was every single weekend. Like, you can't have fun with that many people all the time. Like, it's just, you get tired of seeing. I know, in Tar Heel, Andrew and I would start off great, but in the Tar Heel, we're like, ah! <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> Don't call me. I remember and always having your spot and God forbid if someone set up in your spot. Oh my God. I was like, I do like reserved grooming now for those reasons. I had a lot of scarring moments of not elbowing people enough to get the right spot. So, you know, it's, I think now it, it's just different. So I think people just, if they find their niche and just, go after, you know, the breeds that you're really passionate about and working with good breeders, you can really have a successful business. Right. But, but yeah, I, I see a lot. Clients are great. Like I, I had long, I have lifelong friends now. Yeah. 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 yeah they're family. <laughs> they family. And that's, that's the one piece of advice Andrew used to tell me. Um, and I keep it to like, I, I, I get it and I understand it, but at some point it switches, but he was always like, this is a working relationship. You're, it's, you're a business owner and they're your client. They're not your family. And it's like, I get that separation and like, you want to be professional and you want to keep that separation. But then after so many years, there's a it, threshold that changes. So yes, yeah. it does. And it, it changes over and it's, they're your family. It's, it just becomes your family. So, but, but we, you want to start out with that business relationship and build that over years. And when you can find someone to work with like that, I think it's just, it makes the whole process more fun. So, yeah. Those are good answers. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not going to keep you and ask you one more question. Okay. If you were able, if you were to meet the 20 year old Janice now, what advice would you give her? Oh, breathe. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do everything all the time. Um, I think 
God, when I was 20, I think that was the first year I worked for Clint. And I'm trying to think of even where I was. I think I was still overwhelmed by all the change. Um, I think just knowing that you love the dogs will get you through. Like, no matter what. I mean, I've been through some dark times. Those dogs are what gets you out of bed. Like, as long as that passion is there and that love of the dogs is there, you'll get through anything, whatever tough time is ahead. It, there, that's why we do this. We all love dogs. So just knowing that that's the reason you do it, you'll be fine. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Janice. I appreciate Thanks. your time. It was great to see you. You look great. So, Thanks. As always. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Recognize me with my hair down, so we'll get some pictures. <laughs> yeah. <But I> actually... <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Will. This is fun. Thanks, Janice. That was great. It was good to catch up. You look great, and I'm sure you and Eric had a great vacation, but thanks for giving us your time. If you like what you're seeing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. If you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. Or just go to willalexander.net to find out what's happening in Will's world. Plus, do not forget about the dog show drive every Thursday with Wayne Kavanaugh and myself. Until then, take care, guys.